ASU Library is excited to share with you today's event, celebrating the 10th anniversary of March Memo Madness 2013 to 2023. Today's event will be recorded and will be available soon on the ASU Library YouTube channel. Please share your questions in Q&A with the option for everyone. Questions will be addressed from the Q&A. Thank you for coming and I will now hand the program off to our presenters, Dr. Katie Hind, Associate Professor in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change and the Center for Evolution and Medicine at Arizona State University. And Annalee Mon Perry, Head of Open Science and Scholarly Communications at the ASU Library. Hi everyone and welcome. Uh, we would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge the 23 Native nations that have inhabited this land for centuries. Arizona State University's four campuses are located in the Salt River Valley in Arizona on ancestral territories of indigenous peoples, including the Akamel Otham and Peeposh Indian communities, whose care and keeping of these lands allow us to be here today. Uh, before we get started as folks are rolling in, I would like to ask all of you to um, use the reaction button. Uh, if you are a teacher, please use the reaction uh, to show us a heart. Yeah, there we go. We got the teachers in the house. It's nice to see all of you here today. Um, all right, librarians, those of you who are librarians or library professionals in any way, please use the ta-da reaction. Let's see you here today. Here's a, a couple. We got some librarians. We have a few. Hello. <laughs> all right, students, if you are a student, will you use the applause, the clap reaction? Any kind of student. Yes. Oh, it's lovely to see some students here. Fantastic. All right, last for fans, just MMM fans. Uh, let's do some more hearts. We love our MMM fans. Oh, I see the, I love these reactions. It's so fun to see a flood of hearts and tadas and uh, claps. So welcome everybody. Yeah, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, a decade of Marshmallow Madness uh, in 2023, a really exciting time uh, for us to both think about like what all we've learned through these 10 years and uh, what's new for this year and, and what we're thinking about in terms of moving forward. Uh, so uh, we're going to have uh, some structure today. We're going to go through some um, specific things that we wanted to talk about. Uh, we'll have the return of the dreaded lightning round between me and Annalie. Uh, we'll see if she stumps me again this year like she did last year. Uh, there will be some not yet released information that's going to be included in this webinar for 2023. So those of you that are attending live get to get information before everything is announced on February 21st, next Tuesday. Um, so uh, like, let's begin, uh, first of all, with um, one of the kind of really big things for 2023, and that is the way that we've revamped the LibGuide. So um, Annalie, what's new in the LibGuide and what, what else is involved in the revamp? So I'm gonna share my screen here. We'll see how, how good I am at this. Here we go. You'd think after these years, we'd be good at this. Um, so we, brainstorm starting back in November about ways to make the library guide more helpful and useful to um, all of our uh, all of our fans and folks who engage with March Memo Madness. Um, it, it's been an evolution and that's one of the things we've been talking a lot about is like the needs of the tournament and the community have evolved over the past several years since we first made the LibGuide. So first off, the main page, uh, the first page just at uh, libguides.asu.edu, March Mammal Madness, um, are, uh, that's where this year's basic tournament information is going to be. You can see right on the front page, there's the, cat, there's the tournament schedule. Um, there's going to be brackets that appear here next week. There's a hidden box that will suddenly become public uh, next week. Um, and, uh, you know, most of the um, 
links to the archives of the uh, encounters and battle nights afterwards are going to appear here on this front page. So that's going to make things a lot easier for everybody getting to the content. We've also arranged pages by different groups of communities. So players, you're first. And these are just our, our fans who are just playing for no particular reason, just because they want to play March Memo Madness. Because it's awesome! Because, well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> So we've got um, some great uh, resources for helping you research your combatants, um, illustration and image resources, some wild animal research, and more science resources. So a lot of places you can go to just research your bracket, get ready to go. Learners, these are our students. Um, so this is for teachers, this is the place where you can direct your students depending on their uh, grade levels. If you click on the learners page, you also get a link to the different um, schools. So all of the resources on each page have been curated by our Marsh Mammal Madness team to target those student audiences. So hopefully it'll be age appropriate resources for help your students engage um, and do their research for uh, their bracket. And then educators, you have your own special page that has lots of important uh, uh, educational materials. So um, this will be the place you go to pick up your lesson plans. Um, Katie is, we'll talk more about this uh, later on in the webinar, but Katie's busy making uh, um, videos that we will be embedding here to also help our teachers go. And I want to especially acknowledge the hard work of my intern extraordinaire, Abby Thatcher, who is a uh, grad student in the iSchool program at University of Washington. And she's done a lot of this work in actually making the Live Guide happen. So thanks to Abby. I know she's out there today. Go um, Huskies! <laughs> and I think the other thing I want to highlight is the archive. All of the previous tournaments are now on the archive page. And if you go straight here, there's some background information about the tournament um, and a fantastic roundup of the MMM Champion Hall of Fame. So if you want to look back and see who's won in the past, you can see that right here. Fantastic. This so has been I'll stop sharing for now. Yeah. Yeah, no, this, I mean, the revamp on the LibGuide, it was, um, you know, it's, as you mentioned, the LibGuide's been kind of an evolution, a descent with modification, and there was just like a real punctuated equilibrium this year in really curating all the resources for the, the very, you know, many constituencies that get excited and play March Mammal Madness. So um, it's really wonderful to see, you know, over time, as we added resources, it became just kind of, I think, a, at times, um, a bit like as mentioned by some people, there was a lot of information and knowing what was relevant for which users um, required, you know, I think a, a lot of uh, cognitive load. Absolutely. And so it's really, it's really great because now you can just kind of click to the portal that's most relevant for you. And there's, there's stuff designed for like little kids and middle schoolers, high school, college, um, and really, really focusing on those different kinds of learner communities. And then, um, and then the like the general audience players um, who can also find stuff through the learner portals, depending on how it's being used. We know there's a lot of homeschool groups that use it, a lot of families that play that have kids of all different ages. And so it's just it's just really great to see how this has come together. So big thanks to Annalie and Abby um, for really translating that vision into an actual user interface. Um, and of course, seeing what it is now and what it's become, uh, I really want to ask you, Annalie, as one of our kind of reminiscences, retrospective opportunities. Um, you know, I remember you coming to my office door here at ASU and and saying, "Have you? Are, are you familiar with libguides? I really think a libguide could be useful for March Mammal Madness." And I remember being like, I, "Tell me more." So, could you like tell us a little bit about like? When it occurred to you that this could be a really good resource for March Mammal Madness? Yeah. Um, so my first tournament watching March Mammal Madness was 2016. And I was watching on Twitter because I had started following Katie as a new faculty member at ASU. And I was like, what is going on? Never heard of this. And um, then I loved it. I 
There's a lot of reasons. I love games. There's so many things to love about March Mammal Madness. I love animals. I love games. I love science. I like communicating. And um, and then I saw these scientists posting links to resources in Twitter. I'm like, oh, hey, that's really great. Only nobody on Twitter is actually going to be able to read those because they're behind a paywall. And if you're not affiliated with a, an academic institution, you might not be able to see it. And that was also the year that we really started realizing, Katie, you can correct me about this, but it was when a lot of the educators really started showing up and saying, we want to use this in class. We want to be able to have our students do this. And so there were two things there, right? There, we needed to find ways of sharing resources that would be accessible to everybody, even if they weren't at an academic institution. And then secondly, I know that, you know, especially K-12 teachers often have internet filters at their school. And there's a lot of, you know, Twitter's not one of the things that schools encourage their students to visit. And also, you know, um, and Katie was running things on her blog using Blogger, which again has like a might be blocked. So having a resource that had a .edu URL would make it a lot easier for educators to engage and visit. So LibGuides are a platform uh, that libraries use all over. I'm sure many of you watching use or create LibGuides. And librarians love to gather lists of resources. It's our love language, sharing information with people. And um, that's why sometimes it gets a little overwhelming. Uh, so the LibGuide was a natural fit. It was something that we could create, we could organize in a friendly way and uh, bring um, the community together in a, in a stable platform. Yeah, no, it's been an amazing level up. I, I find myself wondering, um, according to my script, uh, <laughs> I find myself wondering, um, are there a lot of libguides? Like, what do we know about like the number of libguides and like what how the Marshmallow Madness libguide is doing in that libguide space? Yeah, we've had some fun communicating with the libguide libguides hosted by a library, a vendor known as Springshare. So we asked them, how many library guides are there? And how popular is the March Mammal Madness library guide? Well, they said, well, we have 750,000 library guides in the, in the United States. And March Mammal Madness is the 32nd most popular. So that's pretty big, <laughs> 32. <laughs> um, top 32 of uh, all 750,000 li live guides. And um, I will just note, there's like, there's some things we might not ever be able to overcome because like the Library of Congress uses library guides and some other institutions use it for their entire library catalog. So we might not be able to pass that up, but we're, we're gunning for uh, like number 20. Not with that something. attitude. We're coming for you, Library of Congress. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. So yeah, like it, it according to the number, uh, the LibGuide had over seven hundred and forty thousand visits. Uh, so thank you for visiting these curated resources and 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 sharing these um, with your learners or with your family and friends. Um, it's been really amazing to watch the growth of the LibGuide over time. Yeah, it's it's been fun to um, see people engage. So. Now we're going to move on to talking about some of the other new things we have going on this year. And something that Katie worked really hard on was developing a compendium of uh, the last year's tournament and some discussion about our uh, about our progress. And Katie, the title of the compendium is yeah. amazing. How did you ever think of that? I'm going to drop the link to that in the chat here. Yeah. So. So for those of you um, that haven't seen it, it is linked through the LibGuide and you can check it out. It's now, it's a, the, the compendium, basically we took all of the, um, we started doing these sports summaries for the last few years that kind of summarize what happens in the battle play-by-plays in March Mammal Madness. Because not everybody is able to watch the events happen live on Twitter. And, uh, you know, sometimes those like, you know, uh, the we, we archive all of those tweets and we have those in a wakelet PDF so that you can 
you can go back and see all of the action if you would like. Um, but we also created with a team of, of collaborators, we do these little sports summaries that basically create a paragraph blurb of what happened in the battle and, and, and what the outcome was. And so that was called the read all about it. Those get posted every night after the, the battles. Uh, the summaries also are on the LibGuide uh, for people that use screen readers. They're, they're screen reader compatible. We also have the kind of formatted read all about it PDFs that are, you know, have images and, and kind of have like a newspaper layout. So those were coming out as, you know, you know, after the battles uh, night by night. Um, and it was, it was kind of like, well, we should put this all together in one, one location. And so basically the compendium is um, all of the, all of the summaries of all the battles for the tournament, um, nearly all of the citations that we used, the scholarly resources that um, basically helped us craft and write those battles as the narrators. And there's also kind of a photo showcase of all the different contributors to Marshmallow Madness. Since the beginning in 2013, there've been over 50 key contributors to making this tournament possible um, from the narrators that write the battles to the summarists that I just mentioned to our amazing art team. So big shout out to Karen Henning and, and the art team, um, MC Marmot, graphic design by Will Nickley for the bracket. Um, I, I, I hate naming names because then of course you just think about who, you, you know, you're not remembering the name because there's 50 people and, and we have the library team, the educator team, the uh, scholarly communications team. There's just, there's so many different people that make this tournament possible. And so the compendium allows us to kind of showcase all those different contributors and uh, their expertises and, and where they um, are affiliated. Citations, there's, you know, some of the inside jokes, some of the preseason tournament banter. Uh, there's thanks to different, um, different entities that have, you know, celebrated or amplified March Mammal Madness for us. Uh, there, there's pictures of the organizers right there. And it really like let us put it all together into a booklet that's almost 90 pages, right? So this is basically a booklet freely available that summarizes everything that went down in the 2022 tournament. And moving forward, we're going to put these together uh, for all the different tournaments um, moving forward. And then, you know, with all the free time we uh, try to find, we can um, maybe even start putting this together for some of the back tournaments in the past. Uh, and so the, um, the joke about this, it's now published in the ASU library in our Keep collection. So that is freely available to everyone in the public. Uh, you can go get it. You can, um, you can keep the PDF if you want, you can color print it. Um, but when we were putting it together, we had to give it a name. Um, and those of you that are scholars or in the academic community or in the biological sciences, um, you see these kinds of uh, compendiums or proceedings that are put together for conferences. And when I was an undergraduate student before we had citation software, you had to write all of your citations by hand um, or type them by hand. And I remember as a biological scientist who was always reading like natural history and animal science, um, the proceedings of the R Royal Zoological Society, series A and series B, especially series B was like the bane of my existence because it was this like wonderful, wonderful journal with like, like you know, established in the 1800s, just had so much amazing animal science. And I loved that journal, but typing out the journal title was so long. I just, I remember being an undergrad at the library, just being like, ah, the best article I have to cite it, but oh, it's gonna take, you know, just for whatever reason, it just annoyed me. So when we were putting the convenium together, I'm like, oh, 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 we're gonna name it the proceedings of the Noble Zoological Society. Uh, and series B in the proceedings of the Royal Zoological Society, series B is the biological sciences. So we're at the proceedings of the Noble Zoological Society, uh, series C performance sciences, because very clearly we can, we think of March Mammal Madness as performance science. Those battles, the natural history, the scholarly publications that the narrators use to write that, that is, that is, those are the sciences. But because we do this as kind of a live event, um, sometimes with flubs, sometimes with mistakes, sometimes with things that um, get caught by the people that are watching with eagle eyes, uh, there's a performance component to it. 
And that that is part of why we think of the tournament as a performance science, uh, bringing together the life sciences with these kinds of creative performance artistic uh, platforms. That's fantastic. I love the compendium. It is really a work of art. I, I, I maybe was cracking up really hard when it showed up in my Google Scholar as a publication because I mean it yeah. is but like it's I think one of the things that we lose sight of sometimes in science is that there's there's so much opportunity for joy and jokes and celebration within the scholarly community um, and if you look in, at stuff in the past right and in, in, in bygone eras there's lots of hilarious writing in natural history articles. And clearly you, there's a lot, there's a lot of humor. And uh, it would be really great if we could do more to bring that back. And so we're always excited when uh, a paper is published and sometimes they'll like make their author order based on score and March Mammal Madness. Um, so shout out to the articles that have done that um, because everybody contributed equally and so it's like, your last name alphabetically is just as arbitrary. Why not have it be about this kind of fun science activity? Or um, people have shouted out some of the combatant species in their publications, and it's it's really great to see these kinds of you know more fluid dynamics between science engagement and humor and fun and and traditional scholarly publications. So the compendium is 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 a hat tip in both of those directions. I love that because I think one of the things that we see, so in, you know, in my field in scholarly communication, we see a lot about how people are engaging with and communicating uh, their scholarly research. And I think it's always so much more interesting and inviting when, when scholarly authors include humor and a little bit of their personality in their writing, even if it is that like, footnote on how author order was determined. Like all you have to do is read that and you're like, I don't even care what this topic is. I'm reading this paper because I can tell these folks have a sense of humor. It invites people to remember that researchers and scholars are people and we all have like interesting lives and passions and fun things to do. Um, For sure. Yeah. It's really great. So one of the things you mentioned is in some of our past tournaments, like, oh, sometimes we mess up. Sometimes there's a typo. Sometimes the wrong winner is suddenly announced somehow. Um, there have been some glitches and controversies in the past tournament. Why don't we talk about some of those? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, we've had we've had these kinds of really hilarious controversies um, from the live events. But then like, even before that, like when the bracket drops, sometimes those can stimulate some controversies. So I think one of the biggest controversies I can remember from early on in the tournament's history was in 2015, we had a division of mythical mammals. And, uh, and I got some pushback from the public that was like, this is this really important science engagement platform for you know familiarizing the public with you know actual natural history and and you're wasting 16 seeds on not real mammals like that's that's a real missed opportunity Katie and uh and I remember like being like why are you doubting me because the thing that's really fantastic about mythical mammals is that the 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 cultures the people of cultures that create these mythical stories about animals those are often animals that are in their environment Th those mythical creatures are exaggerated or recombined adaptations and traits of real animals in their environment and they and they make stories about them that are oftentimes tethered to aspects of natural history so by having mythical mammals we can talk both about the myth um, maybe getting more people from like the classics or literature interested in our animal tournament and also the animals in the environments that those are based on. Additionally, one of the things I think that's really wonderful about looking at, at the ways that humans create myths, tell and share myths, do narrative and storytelling, these are reflective of our own adaptations within the human species, our abilities to engage in abstract thought and communication of complex language and tell stories and build oral traditions and 
And so a mythical mammals division was, was really this fantastic opportunity to talk about uh, human adaptations for creative thinking and narrative and, and, and the ways in which people learn about dangerous entities um, that are themselves anchored in, with real animals in, in a particular ecosystem. So uh, once that all got explained, people were like, okay, that's, that's pretty cool. Because it is, and it was really, really fun. Um, and, and it's also, uh, you know, for those of you that have been longtime players, a lot of people are always clamoring for carnage. Like we want carnage, we want carnage. And then you'll have some like very, you know, gruesome demise of some sweet animal. And people are like, not like that, not, not that way. <laughs> but when you're dealing with kind of mythical mammals, right? It is, it is abstract, you know, it's not a real animal. And so that allows people to engage. And, and uh, so one of the notable things is that like when we had the critically endangered animal division, right? Like we'd be like, there's 50 left of the species. That was like the least bloody division in the history of the tournament. Like we're like, and that one ran away to then survive and have lots of offspring and help the species recover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so look at that. Um, another kind of a uh, big transition, and we still talk, but this still comes up a lot. Uh, in recent years, we've really been systematic about, you know, expanding it beyond the mammalian class. We have a lot of species that aren't mammals. Sometimes we have species that aren't even animals. And there's a variety of reasons for that, but people are, are just like, no, the tournament's named March Mammal Madness. It should be mammals. Or are you going to change the name? And so the, the thing here is that we really want to celebrate the tree of life we really wanna celebrate evolution and adaptations. And there are incredibly amazing adaptations that aren't in mammals, right? You have to look to these other kinds of animal groups or, or sometimes plants or fungi and, and, and being able to, to, to talk about those other species, I think has been a really important feature of keeping the tournament fresh and interesting and, and moving it forward. Um, and so, Yes, it's more than mammals. Yes, we note that on the bracket because there are times where people will write to me and they'll be like, this species isn't the mammal. It's like, yes, I'm aware. So now the bracket specifically says includes non-mammals. And so just think of, you know, marshmallow madness, the mammals are the mammals and the non-mammals are the madness. And it's just kind of part of this kaleidoscope celebration of, of living entities on this amazing planet we call home. Uh, right now, we have another uh, controversy that's been brewing when we announced the divisions. Uh, so the divisions in 2023 are <laughs> uh, animal engineers, so animals that like build, make, secrete, create, solve, have really interesting abilities to make things. Uh, we have uh, itty bitty comeback city. So these are some of our littlest competitors who are often 16th, 15th, or 14th seeds that usually exit the tournament quite early. <laughs> um, often as someone's a mousse bouche, <laughs> uh, an hors d'oeuvre, if you will. <laughs> Clearly Appetizer. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Um, yeah, we guess we don't have to use only French terms for this. <laughs> and, uh, and we have uh, the mighty stripes. So these are mammal species that have stripes. And then our last division is called dad bods. And, uh, and, and, and so dad bod is a term that became, you know, particularly mainstream um, around 2014, 2015. Um, and it's uh, the recognition that as human fathers, uh, trans, you know, humans, uh, men transition from not being dads into being dads, there are behavioral and physiological changes that happen that can change aspects of their physical appearance. And, and dad bods were celebrated because it normalized normal body changes with different stages of, of, of life, right? And, um, and so it, it became this really, you know, kind of celebrated term. We see it on magazine covers all over the place. Uh, and um, a human biology graduate student at the time at Notre Dame actually was doing research on those behavioral and physiological changes. This is, of course, now Dr. Malika Sarma, uh, who works with the, kind of the world's expert on the biology of fatherhood, Professor Lee Gettler. And um, they wrote a big essay about what we know about 
what causes dad bods. And, um, and we're really excited because Dr. Malika Sarma is going to be one of our narrators in the tournament this year. Yeah, and so she she comes to this with, with great expertise. Now, humans aren't combatants in March Mammal Madness, right? We're not gonna have humans with dad bods. What we're gonna have is a division of species that have physical, behavioral, anatomical, morphological uh, adaptations for paternal care or paternal investment. So we're gonna have a division of, of high investing dads and, uh, and really normalizing that just like the canine and the claw, these adaptations for fatherhood are a triumph of natural selection and evolution. And we're really excited about some of the species that are gonna be featured there of dads that just do some really amazing infant care or, or care of young, because um, not all of them are gonna be infants. Some of them might be tadpoles. Um, some of them might be pigs. Uh, there's some interesting stuff going on in that division. Uh, so we um, we want people to understand that this is about kind of normalizing investing dads. And uh, I think we're really excited about that opportunity. And if uh, for whatever reason, somebody's principal isn't in love with the phrase dad bods, you can just call that division father figures. <laughs> It's okay to like, you know, edit a little <laughs> if you need to. For the big hallway board, just, you know, say father figures. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would hope too, like once you see, like when the brackets release next week, right? And everybody sees the species, we're all going to love it. Like we're going to be like, oh, I did. And or wonder, like, oh, I never heard of this. Like what, why are they in a father yeah, figures or dad. You know, there's all sorts of interesting stuff. There's some real uh, interesting animals that are in that in that division. And, and you know, I will say there's only been like a few quibbles about the division name. Um, by far and away, I'm getting tons of feedback like, yes! <laughs> some teachers have written and been like, my time to shine! <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It's, I think it'll be really, it's really fun. And especially because like these are, you know, we try and bridge to things that are mainstream, that are things you run into in the grocery store checkout aisle or on the evening news or in these other piece, places because that helps reinforce learning um, in the tournament or in the classroom. It, it gives opportunities to like learn new things or share information and scaffold knowledge in really exciting ways. And so these kind of uh, connections in myriad places um, as people are navigating their communities is a really important outcome of, of, of learning. Yeah, I, you know, the first tournament I participated in one of the, um, one of the divisions was mascot mammals. I swear I learned more about like, not just college mascots, but <laughs> you know, I will always remember like some, some of these, uh, mammals but of course now that I'm here on camera I can't remember anything well no so the thing when we put together the mammal mascots that was so much fun because it also gave us a chance to highlight all the different kinds of institutions of higher education so we had military schools and community colleges and you know historically black colleges and universities and we're able to really you know kind of familiarize people with not just the animals that that were being featured but this entire you know set of different ways that people can seek higher learning um, as a really good example of, of recognizing that there's all sorts of institutions that aren't necessarily the Pac-12 uh, to, to mention the one that I went to as an undergrad and now am a professor in um, and so like these, I think I think kind of you know there's always the things that there's always a place that people are very familiar with. And one of the really fun things about the tournament is we use it as a place to take what is known and then also slide in stuff that is new. So we do that with our the species we select, the divisions we showcase, and that's a really great place because if it's all new, it's overwhelming. If it's all known, it's boring. And so that kind of inner mixture allows for this really kind of mosaic opportunity to hook and grow in our in our learning and understanding well yeah I mean and and we know that I'll just say like a, one more anecdote we probably we, we're gonna run out of time because it goes by we talk but um you know my kids who've been doing March my mom madness with me for the last uh few years like it's so funny what they remember like they pull out stuff 
out of nowhere from three years ago when they were like six and they still remember this, you know, this event or this this trait about a creature that they cared about. And so, you know, the storytelling and, and this definitely helps retain information. For sure. And, and using narrative for learning is actually one of the most effective ways to promote retention of knowledge. And, and in many of our other school subjects, narrative is the standard, but it's not as typical in conventional education for science, right? Now, if we were talking about like traditional knowledge ways or, you know, uh, indigenous knowledge uh, communication and, 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 and teaching and learning, that kind of, you know, interconnections of human, animal, and environmental health and, and, and that use of narrative in those spaces with these different characters, that's really, really traditional um, because it is so effective. And, and it's really important if we want people to care about these kinds of topics of animals, environments, and, and how we navigate them, uh, we sh not using narrative is an unforced error among scientists. All right, yeah. so um, I want to mention that uh, it's Love Data Week, and uh, as uh, the scholarly librarian uh, that's really talking about open science, open data, and things like that, um, could you maybe talk about what uh, Love Data Week is and what's going on around ASU libraries about that? Um, yeah, so Love Data Week is a week where um, we try to highlight and uh, emphasize like care and best practices for managing our research data. And one of the main ethics behind this is, you know, kind of like March Mammal Madness um, in helping to normalize um, looking at the data behind any given scholarly output. If it's an article, it's a news, uh, a news post, if it's, um, a uh, book, you know, what, what are the, you know, people are saying this is what the data said. Maybe let's take a look at the data and make sure that that's what the data said. Because there have been a lot of real uh, troubling incidents in history where the data are not actually reproducible, right? Somebody says, oh, here's how I did this experiment and these are the results I found. Somebody else does that experiment and they're like, huh, I got something totally different. I'm not exactly sure that, that this says what you think it says, right? Um, so, you know, that's kind of briefly about some of the aspects of Love Data Week, but I also wanted to use this opportunity to highlight that this is partly why um, for our March Memorial Madness um, scholarly writings and um, articles and other stuff, we have collected them all together in a collection in the ASU Libraries Keep uh, repository. Um, but we also have the data that we have gathered from our community, all of you, uh, as well, that, that inform the article. So you can not only read like some of our publications, but then you can also see the data and see for yourself like the impact and engagement that the tournament has. Yeah, I, I particularly love that the, the Keep Collection, uh, other than the compendium, obviously, but the um, Albert Chen um, it has been doing a phylogeny for years, showing all of the tree of life of the combatants in the tournaments, uh, sometimes color coded for when they um, have exited the tournament or whether they've made it all the way to champion. And so there's a lot of resources in there um, from the scholarly to the visual representation for students and classrooms and just like a really great place for us to put together a lot of the of the content that's worth lasting for March Mammal Madness and as you mentioned the the data um, that we've been collecting uh, anonymized about teachers so that we can get an idea of you know kind of see how it's being used things like that uh yeah Eight. So we've talked a little bit about some of the big lessons that we've learned. I mean, we've learned about collecting resources. We've talked about the impact of narrative. Um, what are some of the other big lessons we'd like to highlight before we skip ahead? Yeah, so I would say that I think the, there's a couple really big lessons that we've learned from March Mile Madness, some of which we touched on. And I'll start with one that relates to the data collection we were just talking about. And that's we now, you know, we really uh, seek feedback from people that are using it with learners, 
So uh, we have surveys of educators. We find out what resources they're using, how they're using them. And that information has really helped us, you know, think about how we organize the LibGuide or how we create lesson plans or how we provide different how-to kinds of, of videos. And, and indeed, what you're going to see in this addresses some of the questions that are showing up in the Q&A and, um, and, and some of the feedback that we've gotten from teachers. So like this year, um, starting next week, there's going to be more orientation videos. So how to play the tournament, how, so there's gonna be one for you know everybody that's playing, how to play the tournament. We're gonna take you inside the tournament and explain how do we pick the combatants? How do we give them seedings? How do we determine the outcomes? How do we write the battles to showcase who wins? So there's gonna be little videos um, that kind of do a three to five minute summary of that information. We're going to have a special video for how to play Marshmallow Madness with the littlest learners. Um, so the tournament is, you know, run by scientists. It's really um, conceptually, you know, organized around high school and, and older in terms of the play-by-play -play science. But there's still a lot of places where, you know, K through five can really get a lot from the tournament. It just requires a few little shifts in how it's approached. And then we're also going to have a video just for our educators about how to make the most of Marshmallow Madness in your classrooms or with your learners. Not, not all of our educators are in classrooms, which we love. Um, and so we'll really just kind of orient all these different kinds of user groups to how to navigate the tournament uh, in 2023 and moving forward uh, to really have it as, as straightforward as possible. So, so thank you so much to all the educators who participate in our survey, uh, because that's been really, really helpful for us to understand where where we can close some of these gaps. Um, so that so basically the big lesson learned here is if you're doing science engagement, listen to your community. <laughs> like it, you know, people aren't talking about science communication anymore, right? Communication has this like implication that it's just like a broadcast kind of thing. Um, but science engagement is where there's, you know, uh, back and forth and listening and, and participation and, and, and really meeting people that are using it you know, where they find it most useful, right? So I would say that a big lesson learned that is, you know, really useful beyond just Marshmallow Madness, it's, you know, listen and, and join in your community to, to really be able to make sure that what you're doing fits. Um, not every element's gonna fit every constituency, but um, the collective is going to be much better positioned with that, with that listening. Uh, the other thing that we've really learned is that uh, teamwork makes the dream work. And that when you, you know, create something that's, that's fun and engaging and inclusive, uh, people love it and they show up with their skill set and they say, hey, um, I noticed that you might uh, benefit from a LibGuide or here's a beautifully graphically designed bracket or here's, you know, art of the combatants or what about sports summaries? What about this? What about that? And, and that I think is one of the most beautiful things about this tournament is that having having started a seed of something that was you know very small that people have loved it that they have invested in it and helped it flourish and and um and my dad always had this phrase called you know you can't you can't milk the cow if you don't feed the cow and that there's a lot of people that show up to feed the cow and uh, and so the tournament has grown and expanded in these just incredible ways um because people are like love it and, and see a place where they can make it even stronger or more effective or level up. And, and that's just been a spectacular, a spectacular thing. So the read all about it, so the artwork, the compendium, all these things that have grown from year to year, it's because it's the most vibrant community celebrating nature I've ever encountered. And I'm absolutely just delighted it exists. It's, it really is one of the most fun things that I get to do. And, and one of the things that I also want to emphasize, like the whole community, the March Memo Madness team, like everybody volunteers their time here. Like none of us have this actually in our jobs. It is, I mean, we might make arguments for working on it on work time, but it's not like we don't actually have a lot of other work to do. So just, you know, for, for it's always good to share that with the community, yeah. right? That uh, it's a, this is an all volunteer effort. Um, it's really, it's about, it's a gift. It's a gift to our communities broadly about like the natural world's amazing and we want to celebrate it. And we hope that you want to celebrate it too. And, um, and that's, 
it's a really incredible thing in a space where, you know, we've, we, we are this kind of autonomous collective of, of kaleidoscope skill sets. And it's made one of, I think, one of the most precious things I've encountered as a scholar. Um, oh, and before we get to the lightning rounds, uh, to reward everybody that is here in real time live, we're going to tell you what the advanced round random habitats are. Uh, so these are so once um, once animals get to the elite trait and the final roar and the championship battle, uh, no longer does the better seeded species have home habitat advantage. They have a, a random habitat that they may be fighting in or encountering one another and they don't always fight as we've mentioned. Uh, so the random habitats for 2023 are da -da -da -da, tropical rainforest, subtropical deserts, ephemeral wetland, and my personal favorite, the fourth habitat is ghost forest. So a Ooh. ghost forest is um, a place where a forest has died and these can happen for a variety of reasons. You could have some kind of uh, acid vent from a geothermal feature. So like a volcanic um, uh, geochemical reaction that kills trees. Um, you could have rising seawaters that are encroaching on uh, forests that are adapted to fresh water. Uh, there's a variety of different ways in which ghost forests can come to be. And uh, so we'll have that as one of our featured habitats, talking about both the uh, natural and human impacts um, that can create ghost forests in 2023. I always love our randomized locations. Yeah, keeping it fresh year after year. <laughs> All right, so we're at lightning round, which yes. we're going to do lightning fast. Lightning fast. All right. Do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Oh, do you want to be asked questions first or do you want to ask me questions first? <laughs> uh, I'll ask questions first. Okay. All right. I'll All right. answer quickly. Well, quickly. Yes. What fictional character do you identify with? Um, oh, okay. That's going to be uh, Amber the Squirrel from Brian Jack's uh, Redwall book series um and that lady amber was from the moss flower series and so she is like she is a, a squirrel archer um uh and and um basically uh uh works with all the squirrel archers uh to defeat um oppressive animals in their woodland uh area so that i think is the character that she's 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 gung-ho and full of energy and sometimes kind of acerbic um but uh she gets she gets the job done so i i, oh. I just when i was a kid and i read that book i was just like i want to be her when i grow up i love it i love it. this see this says a lot about you and the tournament right there <laughs> it's awesome <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay question two what is your go-to potluck contribution? Ooh, that is a great question. Um, if it's winter, it's spicy, cheesy potatoes. Uh, so this is like a combination of potatoes, au gratin, and scalloped potatoes. Cheese on top, cheese in the sauce, both uh, with uh, spicy peppers. Uh, um, in, in summertime, it's often bruschetta. All right. Yum. Uh, potluck at my house next next time. Okay, so if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Oh, um uh, uh I would want to have control over time so that I could have more time every day <laughs> I need more time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. Get more work done. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if that would be it. Okay, so this was a bit more serious. What award or recognition have you received that's been most meaningful to you? Oh, yeah, no, definitely that would be runner up in the March Mammal Madness Halloween cost contest for my team costume with my dog Bandit. <laughs> when, when, um, yeah, so like I put it on my CV, um, I guess yeah. like a quick answer because, all right, so a real answer um that's a great answer yeah but but uh I mean I do I do I do put that award on my CV I'm very very proud to be a runner-up um uh so um I think that the one that really 
I was really, 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 really proud of was I was the alumni of the year for my community college. And I loved being a community college student. I transferred to uh, the big state school in Washington State. I went from Seattle Central, then Seattle Central Community College to the University of Washington. Um, I grew up in poverty. My parents didn't have any money to help me go to college. And, uh, and so community college became kind of a really economical way to, to, to begin my education. My parents didn't graduate college. Um, and so community college was a really great place for me to start. And then I, I went from there to the University of Washington. I love the University of Washington, you know, PhD, professor, right? The whole, the whole academic trajectory, but getting to go back to my community college and give an address at graduation um, and kind of talk about like how having been a student at a community college, I, I feel like such an, I, I'm so enriched in the community of learners I was embedded in at that time. And it turned like that was a huge part of my worldview and, and is part of why I love being at Arizona State University, because this is a state school that has that same ethos of education should be accessible to everyone. And we have classrooms of all different types of learners. And I know this is a lightning round and we should be answering things quite quickly, but I, I'm really, really proud of that award and it's meant a lot to me. I'm, I'm glad. I mean, it's really special and I'm glad you took the time for that. I was, yeah, yeah you've won a lot of awards. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to skip my fifth question so we okay. can get back on because I want to get to some of our um, Q&A also. I, I have been looking at the, the the attendee questions and have been embedding some of the answers in my answers. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll ask you uh, three questions so we can stay oh. on, you know, closer to time. Have you ever had an amazing encounter with a wild animal in nature? Mm, an amazing encounter. Like last year when I had that encounter with yes. a, like adult male grizzly in Yellowstone that, I mean, like that's going to last my whole life. Like that's my big, amazing animal encounter. I was I, in my forties when I had it though. So, you know, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a similar Yellowstone story um, in that my family was camping when I was young at uh, the Grand Teton. Uh, we were in at Jenny Lake. I still always remember Jenny Lake. And um, a big moose came through the campground. It was like hanging out in our camp right by our tent. This was pretty early in the morning. The rest of us were kind of up, but my brother was still asleep in the tent. But then like we're like oh my gosh it's a moose oh. and then all of a sudden we hear from my brother like this scream because he was really shocked to see a big moose shadow right there on the tent yeah no so, i mean they, yeah that was pretty amazing they are they are big their anti-predator skill set gets deployed against humans plenty and they are stompy scary <laughs> yeah yeah. All right. Great answer. Okay. Um, what is something you wish people knew about ASU libraries? Um, we, okay, here's my, here's my solid thing. We fundamentally help enable every single amazing thing that ASU does. So if ASU does anything amazing, there's some library service resource or person behind that. Just saying. Yes. Agreed. I, I think that's a really good point. Okay, um, coffee, tea, or soda? Coffee. All right, and how do you take it? Black Ooh. and hot. All right. Nice. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and continuously. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, and then, all right, last question. What is a national park or other public land you really want to visit and why? Oh, Glacier National Monument, National Park, um, because it looks amazing and I really want to go there and spend a good amount of time. Fantastic. All right. Excellent. Yeah. All right. So that's the end of our lightning round. And now we still have five minutes for questions. Yay. Questions a from lot. the audience. So I will just note for everybody who wants us to repeat the um, the locations. Um, we can do that. We'll just type it in. Uh, and they will all be on the library guide next week. Yes, uh, they are tropical rainforest, subtropical desert, ephemeral wetland. So wetlands that, that fill up and dry up um, periodically, oftentimes annually. 
and Ghost Forest. When I decided on these locations, I forgot that I have a lisp and I should never say these words out loud. <laughs> okay, uh, one of our, okay, so some folks are asking a little bit about the logistics, like how many battles happen a night? How often do they take place? Why don't we share that kind of, that up? Yeah, so this will come out in the calendar, but usually we have um, no more than eight battles a night. Uh, so we have first round each division, those are eight battles each, then uh, second round is two divisions, four battles each, but eight battles in the night. Then we get to the sweet 16, so that's 16 species or animals from species, so that's eight battles. Uh, and then um, once we get to the elite trait, it's four battles, the final roar is two battles, and then the championship is a single battle. So the calendar is going to list all that, um, and the, the visual calendar will come out on Tuesday. Yeah, so if you look on the lib guide now, you can see the nights the different battles are going to take place. But next week, it'll actually have the division names and for who's going on what night. Everything that you guys are asked, that there are like all the questions about the kind of mechanics of the tournament, those are going to be on the lib guide uh, for everyone as of Tuesday. Teachers, you'll get an email a little bit before that probably Monday. Um, and we're going to have videos that kind of work through the game mechanics very specifically. So all of that will be um, in videos that you can watch on demand, brief videos. And we're going to put together slide decks that you can use with your learners as well. If you would like to go through things slower or insert your info for your class, we'll have slide decks for you as well as the videos. Okay, we have a question about have humans ever been included in the tournament? No, we never include humans um, for a variety of reasons. It'd be really tricky to, you know, what's the quintessential human that you would have in these battles. We do do, we do have human relatives. So we've had Neanderthals, we've had Australopithecus afarensis, um, we've had Ardipithecus ramidus, um, so we have we have featured uh, different fossil human species, but no humans specifically, Homo sapiens sapiens. Okay, I think we can squeeze in one more question. We already know the winner. We know the winners before the brackets go out so that the tournament is impervious to fan chatter. Uh, we do not want fan favorites or fan villains uh, to, um, to, to shape how we approach the tournament and, uh, write the narratives. Oh, sometimes we do some fan service and the kind of storylines, but in terms of the outcomes, those are all determined before the bracket goes out. Great question. And that will be, that will, will we'll unpack a lot of that in the video inside the tournament. Right. As well as the question about the seating and, uh, methodologies for selecting uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. We're gonna we're gonna have you, you know obviously we don't um uh don't call it selection Sunday because that's basketball but um we do uh we do have a whole process and we'll talk about that when we do the inside the tournament video. Uh the the if you filled out the survey you will get an email Monday late afternoon depending on your time zone. So uh, everything will be available to teachers before, before we publicize it widely to the general public. Um, and uh, everything is available for three weeks before the tournament actually begins. So lots of time to have, you know, to do research, to figure out your outcomes, to rethink your decisions, to debate, uh, lots of opportunity for all of that pre-tournament planning. Okay, our last question is, can we share the dad bod article? We, we will have that on the libguide. Um, also, when so when we have the divisions on the night that they battle, there's always kind of like an MC introductory showcase of what, you know, why this division exists, um, links to resources, and those will be in the read all about it the next day. So there will be many times that you get access to that. Great. I actually want to read that too, so I'm really happy somebody asked that. Yes, yeah, we'll have it on the libguide for you. We squeezed it right in. Patty's ready to sign us out. <laughs> Thank you, ASU Libraries, for hosting this event. ASU Library would like to extend a big thank you to Dr. Katie Hine 
and Annalene Mon Perry for bringing their energy, enthusiasm, and expertise to today's event. We would also like to thank you for attending today. Today's event has been recorded and will be available soon on the ASU Library YouTube channel. Thank you for coming. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. And if you're learning, you're winning.